Oftentimes I've wondered, even in my darkest hour, what is faithful here still hearken to my needs and my desires. Then I hear his voice so tender, speaking softly in my ears. I kneel down and pray in my secret place, and I know that he will hear for he is always near when he speaks peace the raging storm must die new hope becomes new life when he whispers everything will be alright when he speaks peace the dark night slips away like the breaking of the day when Jesus speaks peace when my friends have failed me and I'm standing all alone when my spirit is discouraged and I feel all hope is gone there's no need to be disheartened for I have a friend who cares When my faith becomes weak I can kneel at his feet And my burdens he will bear For he is always near When he speaks peace The raging sore must die New hope becomes new life whispers everything will be all right when he speaks peace the dark night slips away like the breaking of the day when jesus speaks peace when he speaks peace the raging storm must die new hope becomes new life when he whispers everything will be all right when he speaks peace the dark night slips away like the breaking of the day when jesus speaks peace peace Wonderful peace when Jesus speaks peace. Amen. Thank you, Brother Drake and our musicians. God bless you so much uh, for the good song. Now with your Bible open, please, John's Gospel, chapter number 1, and I want to begin reading with verse number 1, and let's read down through verse number 14 together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was the life, and the, light was the, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. This was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Last week I started this little thought on the greatest story in human history. And I believe the greatest story in human history is that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, if you look at it, His story is actually history. You can look back through time and the will of God has been done and played out on every level that you can imagine. And I know people don't stop and take time to look. But the will of God is being done in our very day. I think we're headed toward the climax of the day when the Lord comes for the church. There will be a tribulation of seven years on this earth. And then the Lord's going to come back and usher in the millennial kingdom here on the earth. For a thousand years he'll rule and reign from Jerusalem upon the throne of his father David. At that time he's going to del deliver up the kingdom to God the Father. The great white throne of judgment will take place. And we're going to enter into eternity future. When we get out there and look back I think we're going to find that the purposes and the will of God has been done all through human history. His story will indeed become history. But here in this particular text, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ is the pre-existing Word. Before there was ever a beginning, before there was ever a world created, God, the Lord Jesus, existed with God the Father. Pre-existing uh, Word before the world ever begun. There was a time that He became the creative Word. When God spoke and everything that is came in to existence. You know today we're teaching as fact the theory of evolution. Our kids are bombarded with it from the time they go into elementary school to they graduate on every hand. You don't hear any mention anymore in our society about creation. It's all the Big Bang Theory and how evolution got started. And uh, listen, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does that God spoke up and everything that is came into being. And you know, the effort is to do away. If you cannot do away with God as creator, then one of these days as his creatures, we're going to have to give an account to our creator. You look at the world and all there is. Why? This didn't come about by a big bang or by accident. No, there's a divine intelligence behind it when God said, and it came into being. And man that was made in the image of God, how fearful and wonderfully are we made. And even man has the fingerprints of God still all over him. And listen, we're going to live in eternity somewhere. And it didn't all just happen. This didn't happen by evolution. God created it. And the Bible puts him forth here as the creative word. I like what Dr. Jack Hudson said. He said, I was a tadpole when I began to begin, then a frog with its tail tucked in. Then I became a monkey on a limb in the tree. Now I'm a doctor with a Ph.D. <laughs> Amen. No, I want to tell you something. It's not evolution. God said, and it was so. That's how it came into being. And so he was a creative word. But then finally, he became the incarnate word. God became flesh. The thoughts of Almighty God. And all of its splendor and wonder and beauty and glory and creative ability uh, wrapped his thoughts in human form. And it was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh, the Bible said. So we talked about the greatest story in human history. In this passage last week we talked about the greatest reality in human history. That Christ Jesus came into the world. I bless his name that he was willing to leave the ivory palaces of glory and step down into this world where we are. He came to where we were. Blessed reality. And you know, it is a fact that there was a man named Jesus that lived and died, was buried, rose again the third day. While we don't doubt that, that is a fact of history. And you know, the old devil tempts us sometimes to disbelieve that. Now, why does the devil fight the history that we have handed down to us? Well, there was a man that they said lived named Abraham Lincoln. 
became president in 1860. Now I would ask you something. Do you believe that? Well, how do you believe that? You never met Abraham Lincoln. Even your mom and dad and grandpa did not know Abraham Lincoln. They never saw him. But we don't doubt that, do we? Why, we just accept that. The devil does not tempt us to doubt that there was a man who lived and was president of the United States in 1860 to 65 uh, by the name of Abraham Lincoln. But you know, the devil does fight and the devil does tempt us not to believe that Jesus Christ lived in this world. But it is a fact, a reality, that he came into the world where we are. I see the reality of his incarnation in verse number 14. The reality of his habitation in verse 14. The Bible says that he came and dwelt where? Among us. And then the reality of his revelation. I'm glad that God has made himself known to us that we might put our faith and our trust in him. Then we talked a little bit last week about the greatest tragedy in human history. And it's found in verse 10 and verse number 11. Now think about verse 10 with me and just let it soak into your heart for just a minute. Notice this great thought. He was in the world and the world was made by him. His creation, he had made it and spoke it into existence. And then the process of time, he himself born of a virgin and walked upon the very soil that he himself had created. And notice the last part, and the world that he created and placed into being did not know him. Now boy, that's a sad thing, isn't it? What a tragedy it is that those were the very creation of his hands was in the world. They looked on him and they didn't recognize him. Didn't know who he was, the Bible said. So there's the greatest tragedy in the world. Verse 12, he, or verse 11, he came into his own, and his own received him not. And the greatest tragedy in human history is that men would reject him. They reject him as their creator. They uh, reject him as their savior. Now in verse 11, where it says he came into his own, talking about the Jewish people, uh, the people of Israel. Why God had worked for 2,000 years through the Old Testament, beginning with Abraham. And if there was ever a nation that should have been prepared for the coming of their Messiah, their King, their Creator, it should have been the nation of Israel. But even they rejected Him and said no to the Lord Jesus Christ. Greatest tragedy in human history. They rejected the love of the Sovereign. They rejected the light of the servant John in this passage. And they rejected the life of the Son of God. And they nailed Him to a cruel cross. So the greatest tragedy in the world. You know the only sin that will send a person to hell is the sin of rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We name over a bunch of sins and we think about how terrible they are. And they may be terrible. We think of drunkenness, immorality, adultery. We think of thievery, robbery, stealing, murder. All the great sins, lying, all the things that you can talk about. And we think, boy, that's the greatest sin that there is. We categorize them. But no, no, that's not the greatest sin. The greatest sin is saying no to the Lord Jesus Christ and rejecting Him as your personal Savior. That's the tragedy of it. And then finally today I want to talk to you about this and zero in on this if you will. Notice if you will, the greatest possibility in human history And it's found in verse number 12. Though he was rejected by his world, though he was rejected by his own nation, says in verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I'm glad to report that there is a possibility of salvation because Jesus came into the world. Had he not come, we might could ignore God. Had Jesus not been born into the world and showed us the love of God, it might be possible that we could push Him back and refuse to think about Him. But because God's gone to such great lengths, it brings to us this possibility that we can know Him and be saved. And boy, that's what salvation is. It's knowing God and God knowing us. Possibility of this salvation. Notice, if you will, the people of this salvation says in verse number 12, but 
or in contrast to his own people who rejected Christ and said no. But as many as received him, the people of this salvation, as many. Now how many people are saved today? And I would think probably those that are in church today, the majority, the vast majority of people today, I think, that sit in church are saved and they name the name of Christ. But think about it in our community. Think about it in our county, the United States. How many people are saved? We don't know. But I do know this, as many as will believe on him can be saved. I thought about, uh, the Bible talks about in the book of Romans, about when the fullness of the Gentiles will be come in. That means this, that those, all those who are going to be saved that makes up the bride, the body of Christ, one day the last one is going to be saved and Christ is coming back to receive the church unto himself. The dead saints are in the cemetery. They're going to be raised and they're going to be ushered into heaven. How many will that be? I don't know. But I will say this, as many as are willing to receive him as Savior, they are the people of salvation. When we say the people of salvation, we're not talking about a certain race of people. We're not talking about a certain class of people or a certain group of people or an elect group of people, but as many as believe on him. I'm glad you can take a whosoever will gospel and you can encircle the globe and you'll not run into a person no matter the color of their skin on the globe that is not a candidate for God's salvation. I don't believe in a limited atonement. I believe Christ died for everybody. And as many as will believe on him can be saved. They make up the people of God. And I'm glad that I'm numbered amongst the people of God. Can you imagine what it's going to be when all of us get home to heaven from every generation? I'm talking about way back in the days of Adam all the way up to the great white throne of judgment. God's going to have a multitude of people that believed on him. They are the people of salvation. And I'm glad it's possible for all people to be saved. And then notice, if you will, in this text, the person of salvation. For it says in verse number 12, But as many as received him. Who is the him? The him is none other than Jesus Christ. The person of salvation. Paul said this, I know whom... I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Boy, I wish we could get this point across, that salvation is not a creed. It's not a ceremony. It's not in a bunch of rules and regulations of do's and don'ts, but salvation is a person. It is Jesus Christ. Nothing else, it is Jesus and Jesus only. A lot of folks talk about the man upstairs or the boss man in the sky or something like that. I want to tell you something, the old man in the sky, I want to tell you something, God don't get old. <laughs> he ain't upstairs anyway. I'll tell you where he's at, he's everywhere. He sits on his throne in heaven. He made himself known through his son, Jesus Christ. And the person of salvation is none other than Christ our Lord. Boy, I'm glad that I know him as my personal Savior. Boy, religion wants to put us all in a straight jacket and says, you got to do this. you got to jump through this kind of an old religious hoop. you got to do this good work or that good work. I want to tell you, it's not doing any of that. It is knowing him who went to Calvary, died for our sins, was buried, and raised for our justification. It is a person. It's Jesus Christ. And we know him as a person in a personal relationship. And boy, as such, we're on a one-to-one -one basis. And salvation is not joining a group of people. No, no, it's what I've done with Christ. It's one-on-one -on -one with him. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Knowing him the Bible said in the last days Jesus gave the warning that there would come a day when many would come unto him in that day and say, Lord, Lord, said we not prophesy or preach in your name and done many wonderful works while we've even cast out devils in your name. And Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. So salvation is a personal relationship 
the greatest possibility in human history is that God provides a salvation in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad that I know Him. I'm glad that I got saved before the Baptists got their hands on me or the Catholics or the Methodists or the Pentecostals or any other group. I got saved. I've come into a personal knowledge of who Jesus is. I remember when I was a little boy, my mother would read the Bible to us. She'd read some of the stories of the Old Testament. I love many of them. I love to hear David slaying the giant. I like that. I like to hear about Jonah and that whale of swallowing him up. Boy, I liked old Jonah. I thought, boy, what a time it had been to live back in those days. Other passages I read in the Old Testament scared me. And I realized that God was a God of judgment. But I remember when she'd read out of the New Testament, she'd read the things that Jesus done. I want to tell you that blessed me. And I remember thinking, I like this Jesus character. I liked him. And I knew of him from the time that I was a little fellow. Grew up in Sunday school hearing about him. But that doesn't replace the day, the blessed day, that I knew him in a personal way and invited him into my heart to be my Savior. I'm glad that I know God. And I know God through Jesus, his Son. Therefore, I don't refer to him as the old man in the sky. I want to tell you something. He's not an old man in the sky. He's my Lord. One time, me and one of the deacons in our church, we went fishing. And I was always a jeeps. This fellow would go fishing by himself and catch fish, and I'd go and wouldn't catch anything. But anyway, me and one of the deacons in the church went fishing one day. And uh, we was getting our stuff ready, and we was at this dock, and there's a marina there, and there's a lot of people around. There's a fellow on the boat right beside of us, and he was putting his stuff in the boat, and nothing seemed to be going right. I don't know really what was wrong with him, but he was a cussing like a sailor. <laughs> and uh, he called God's name in vain a couple of times, and I don't like to hear that. I didn't like to hear that, and I was a drunk. But he called God's name in vain a couple of times, and I just go to sort of walk away where I wouldn't have to hear it. Not this fella. He went over to where he was, and he looked at him, and he said, Hey, fella, said, you talking about my Lord. I said, I don't appreciate that. And I'll tell you something. I admired that man for taking a stand like that. I just hate that I was such a wimp that I wouldn't go over there and tell him that. But uh, he didn't care if that fella liked it or not. And he witnessed to that man. But I want to say this. The possibility of salvation is not knowing a bunch of principles and not knowing a bunch of rules, not being baptized, not partaking of mass, but salvation is a person. If you got Jesus, you got salvation. Great possibility. And then not only do I see uh, the person of salvation, but I see the plan of salvation. Notice, if you will, in verse number 12. As many as received him, to them gave me the power to become the sons of God even to them, notice this, that believe on His name. Believe on His name. What is God's plan of salvation? It is believe and thou shalt be saved. Salvation is not repeating a bunch of creeds. It's not joining a church. It is a belief that the Bible's who God said Jesus was. He is the Son of God plan of salvation the Philippian jailer said sirs what must I do to be saved boy that's a good question isn't it you may be asking yourself how can I be saved what must I do in order to be saved and it says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved I'll tell you what convicting of the Holy Spirit does it makes you see your need of God Unless the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you see yourself as lost and undone and headed to hell without God and without hope, you'll never turn to God. But the Holy Spirit helps you to see your great need of salvation. And another thing the Holy Spirit does is when you see that and you feel that guilt and weight of your sin, seems like the Holy Spirit's job is to cut off every avenue of escape that you may have except for one, and that is to trust and believe on Jesus Christ alone. As long as you think you can be saved by reforming, turning over a new leaf, or doing good works, or doing something to make you accepted in the sight of God, I'll tell you, you're not ripe for salvation. But when you see yourself as in need of a Savior, going to hell and deserving to go there, 
And the Holy Spirit so works in your heart that the only rescue, the only hope that you find is in Jesus alone. And you come and surrender to Him, bow to His Lordship and believe on Him as your Savior. That is the work of the Holy Ghost. That is God's plan of salvation. There's a lot of folks base their hope of heaven on what they do, what church they're a member of, how much they give. has absolutely nothing to do with any of that. Salvation's plan is by believing on Jesus Christ and that alone. Any good work, that you, can, that you can think about, throw it away. And when you're left with nothing but believing Jesus, that's when salvation comes. It's based on believing. And then I find the power of this salvation as well. Notice, if you will, as many have received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The power to become the sons of God. Now, I can declare myself to be a son of God. That don't mean much. Matter of fact, that's rather blasphemous to call myself a son of God with anything other than believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But to them that believe, he gave the power, the authority to become the sons of God. The power of this salvation. Do you realize the power of God it takes to save a person? How could you... How, how can you uh, sum it up and how can you recognize what kind of power does it take to become a son of God well I'll tell you what kind of power it takes remember when Jesus was raised from the dead and he went out and met with his disciples after his resurrection he said this all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth and he commissioned those disciples to take the gospel to the four corners of the earth. Matter of fact, he said this, Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16, uh, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of God. How do you measure the power of God? Well, I want to say it took the power of God to raise up Jesus from the grave. Nobody else had ever raised from the grave like Jesus did. He laid his life down. He said, I have the power to lay down my life. And listen to this. And I have the power to take it up again. And buddy, I ought to tell you inside that tomb on that third morning, it was the power of God that raised up the Lord Jesus Christ. Resurrection power. And that's exactly what it took to save you and me. For you know what the Bible said? Jesus said this in John 5 and verse number 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath the present tense everlasting life and shall not. And the word shall not there means shall not, shall never, ever, ever come into condemnation. But listen to this. But is past from death unto life. You know what happened when I got saved? God's power worked in my life. It birthed me into the family as a son of God. You say, how much power did that take to do that? It took as much power to save me as it did to raise Jesus from the dead. Same Spirit of God worked in him that worked in me to bring me to Christ. The power of this salvation we have become the sons of God. And aren't you glad for that? Not that we're going to be one day the sons of God. We already are. <laughs> huh? Beloved, now are we the sons of God, the Bible says. And the sentence of death that was hanging over us no longer hangs over our head. We've escaped that. Boy, the greatest possibility is salvation. Greatest possibility in human history. And you know what? The possibility of that is so great that I can go anywhere in the world, preach a whosoever will gospel, tell them about Jesus Christ and who he is, how to be saved. There's not a place in the world that that don't fit. That fits everywhere. Worldwide. Boy, God wants the world to know about that. He came into his own, the Jewish people. They rejected him. They crucified their Messiah. They said, we'll not have this man to reign over us. But you know what God did? 
He turned to the Gentiles and for 2,000 years he's been calling both Jews and Gentiles unto himself, calling out a people for his name's sake. One day the last one's going to be saved, the church is going to be made up, and we're leaving this old world. The greatest possibility, salvation. And I'm glad for it, aren't you? I'm glad I have believed on and accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I'm not counting, listen, I'm not a good fellow. I'm not counting on these years that I've been preaching to get me to heaven. I'm not counting on my church membership to get me to heaven. None of that is not sufficient. But I want to tell you what is. What's that song, my plea, when I get home to heaven? What will be my answer? Only one thing, that Jesus died in my place. I have his blood to show. That's what's going to get me to God's heaven. The greatest possibility. This is the greatest story in human history. The reality of his coming, the tragedy of his rejection, and the possibility of his salvation. Our Father, this morning, we thank you for every person that is here. I pray your blessings upon them. Maybe somebody watching or listening today, and I ask you, God, to speak to their heart. Help them to be saved before it's everlasting too late. We believe you're soon coming. And Lord, we look forward to that blessed day. But many are not ready. They're afraid that if you were to come today that they'd be left behind. And Lord, I ask you to help them understand that they can be saved and know it without any shadow of a doubt. And we'll give you praise for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Because